On this tinkering project, I need to engrave a custom logo onto a trinket box that won't fit into my engraving machine. If you want to see what I did, stick around and let me show you how. Before we start on this project, I want to take a moment to talk about workshop safety. This demonstration is just for fun. I'm removing the guards and the protective panels to give you a better view of what's going on. Don't hold me responsible for any damage that you cause to yourself, your workshop or your home. So don't try this at home. You should always read, understand and follow the instructions that come with your equipment. And remember, since we're working with lasers, there's no more important piece of safety equipment than these. Safety glasses. Now that's out of the way, let's get on with the project. This is my supercarver laser. You may have seen it in other projects where I've used custom jigs to make quick and repeatable engravings. The trinket box I'm using here would just about fit between the uprights, but that leaves hardly any distance between the laser and the surface that needs to be engraved. The lens mechanism won't allow me to focus that close to the diode. Even if I created a new jig that lowered the box a little, I'd get no more than an extra centimetre of room to play with. It is a very simple box with brass effect corners on the lid, a nice clasp and brass hinges around the back. I could very easily remove the lid by taking out the screws, but that could weaken the wood or damage the screws. Plus, if I wanted to run this process as a batch, I would have to repeat those steps on each box. So if I can't get the material into the machine, how do I go about getting the laser to engrave something on the outside of it? This laser pen will help me explain a little of the optics. Laser light is made up from a series of parallel beams, emitted from a diode in this case, or a tube in bigger machines. This light will travel in straight lines until it hits something, like the wall here in the tinker space. Now you can change the direction of the beam of light by using a prism. Binoculars and periscopes tend to use these. The laser enters one of the shorter sides, is reflected and comes out the other of the shorter sides. Here's what's going on. There is a change in the medium, the stuff that the light is travelling through. It goes from air to glass to air again. Internally, the laser hits the back wall of the prism and should move back out into the air again. However, because it strikes it at a critical angle, the beam undergoes something called total internal reflection. It then reflects back at the same angle, relative to 90 degrees. As the final transition from glass to air is pretty much straight on at this point, the beam comes out and carries on towards the wall. Another way you can change the direction of a beam of light is with a mirror. Now this may seem pretty basic, but let's walk through it all the same. Household mirrors are a thin piece of glass with a reflective coating on one side. The beam hits the glass and bounces off at the same angle. Every day you won't notice this, but internally the light changes direction ever so slightly when it enters the glass due to refraction. This happens just before it's reflected and again just after when it leaves the glass and comes back into the air. For the cleanest kind of reflection, you would use something called a first surface mirror. The beam of light hits the surface of the mirror as before, is reflected and carries on towards the wall. I think even here you can see that the spot on the wall is a little sharper than before. What's happening is that the reflective surface is added to the front surface of the mirror, so there's no refraction taking place. The light hits the mirror and bounces straight off. To show the reason why I'm going to be using a mirror instead of a prism for the rest of this project, I've created this column of light. Now the wall isn't perfectly flat, but I can show you that the light is pretty uniform using this card. When I introduce the prism, you can see that the column of light that is reflected through it is heavily distorted. A single beam may look fine, but across the structure of the prism, the imperfections in the glass cause the column of light to twist and deform. If I try the same again with my mirror, you can see that it doesn't suffer from the same problems. This coupled with the fact that the mirror weighs significantly less than the prism is why I'm going to add one to my engraver. In a previous project I showed you how I built my own jig to replace the moving platform in the supergarver. I'm using one of those with a square snap on frame, into which I add my mirror which has been mounted at 45 degrees. This entire assembly then magnetically clips into the engraver. 
Now it's time to put your safety glasses on. With the laser in lowest power mode, I can show you that the beam exits the diode vertically downwards. It strikes the mirror at 45 degrees and is reflected away from me towards the wall. The focus of the laser is not really affected by the mirror and I've adjusted the focal point to be just outside the metal frame of the engraver. I'm using a rattle can lid as a platform, which allows me to carefully slide in the box to be engraved. For safety, you should really cover any reflective surfaces with tape before moving them in front of a carving laser beam. Using the preview mode of the software for this engraver, I can move all the axes and show that the beam moves around too. As the diode moves left and right, that translates to left and right movement across the face of the box. When the jig moves in and out of the mechanism, this translates to up and down on the face of the box. This means that the vertical movement is opposite to what you would normally expect in this machine. To compensate for this, I take the logo that I'm going to engrave and flip it vertically. All that is left to do is click start. The machine goes through the preview cycle again to show where it will be engraving and then ramps up the laser power to engrave the surface. With this machine, the reflected laser light normally bounces back up inside the frame. As we've altered the beam, the backscatter is coming out towards the camera and the CCD is having a hard time processing all that light energy. You can see though that the software starts engraving from the top of the image and this is flipped on the surface and you can see the scan lines moving up the piece. I used some 80 grit sandpaper to remove the surface lacquer from this box prior to engraving it, but I think I may have missed a little bit. In the end, I trimmed the image to be carved and had it cut over the missing section one more time. You won't be able to see the join. And with that, the engraving is complete. I think this turned out okay in the end. All the letters have been carved onto a box that doesn't fit inside the engraver and I haven't had to take it apart. The clasp works as it did before and the lid hinges and returns to the correct place. Not a bad result if I do so so myself. I hope you've enjoyed this project and will subscribe to keep up with the other laser projects that I have in mind. But that's it for this project. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.